Okay, welcome one more Thursday to our heterogeneous systems course. Today we are going to cover a new parallel pattern. I think this is going to be the last one uh, for this semester. It's a graph search, an important, an important parallel pattern, as you will see as well. Remember that we have been covering several important parallel patterns in previous lectures. We talk about the reduction and operation that reduces a set of value values to a single value. And uh, the, this operation needs to be associative, commutative, and has a, ha, have an identity value. Uh, we discuss how to optimize this code, how to write code that is divergence-free uh, in a way that when threads st start retiring iteration after iteration, the uh, warp utilization keeps being as, uh, as high as possible. The second parallel pattern that we studied was the histogram computation. Remember that a histogram is a data structure that contains beans or counters that are uh, going to count the number of uh, occurrences for certain values or for ranges of values that appear in a certain input data set. Remember as well that when we talk about uh, the parallel implementation of histogram co computation, uh, we talk about the need of using atomic operations. And atomic operations um, are very useful, but they also have a um, entail an important overhead because they cause the realization when we have conflicts, when we have threads accessing uh, the same or trying to update the same memory position. Uh, we discuss different ways of optimizing the histogram computation and uh, we talk about privatization. In, in, in the end, in privatization, the idea is to create multiple private histograms that are updated by only a subset of threads uh, of the grid, these, uh, the threads, for example, belonging to the same thread block can have their own subhistogram in shared memory. And after the subhistograms are complete, uh, we will have uh, a reduction step uh, in order to compute the final histogram that will be stored in global memory. Privatization is a technique uh, very useful for histogram computation. And we are going to see uh, today, like a different version of privatization can also be very useful uh, for graph applications. The next uh, parallel pattern that we covered is convolution. Remember that convolution consists of uh, placing a mask uh, or, or a filter uh, on top of the all the elements of an input image and uh, input image or some uh, input data structure. And remember that um, <clears throat> after applying, uh, after placing the mask, on top of the of the input, we obtain some partial products, and we, then we reduce them uh, to obtain a final value. And that uh, can be done in one dimension or more than one dimension. Here we have an example uh, with a two-dimensional um, convolutional filter. In, in this uh, particular case, uh, this is a representation or simplified representation of a, a, a convolutional layer. And we also discussed in, the, in that lecture that convolutional layers can be uh, converted into matrix multiplication operations that are even more suitable for the uh, GPU architecture. And it's easier applying, uh, the, let's say, um, so more sophisticated optimizations uh, on them. The next parallel pattern that we cover is the prefix sum, also very important, uh, primitive for many parallel applications. Remember that in the in the prefix sum, we have an input array, we have an associative operator, and we obtain an output array where each of the elements of the output array is computed based on the uh, previous elements of the input array. We discuss different ways of implementing uh, this prefix sum or scan, but in the end, uh, all these different ways were had a, a hierarchical approach. Like for example, this hierarchical scan, scan, add operation where we first uh, perform per block scan operations, then we uh, scan an array of partial sums, and finally, we add some offset uh, to the values in the output array in, in order to obtain uh, the final values. Uh, for each of these different um, stages or the scan stages, uh, we presented a couple of uh, basic algorithms. One of them, probably the most uh, uh, more uh, most widely used these days in GPUs, is the cohistone parallel algorithm. And last week, uh, we talked about uh, sparse matrices and computation using sparse matrices. We, we, we said that ma sparse matrices are very challenging because they are difficult to handle due to the fact that most of the elements of a sparse matrix uh, are zero. But we also uh, 
uh, said that these represent some opportunities as well, because we can save space, we can save memory bandwidth, and we can save computation because we don't need to operate uh, on those elements that are zero. So uh, due to that, uh, the most common way of storing sparse matrices in memory is uh, using some compressed format. Uh, we presented several compressed formats in the previous lecture, uh, being the most widely used probably the, um, uh, the, the, the CSR uh, format where uh, we use an array of pointers to point to the uh, place where uh, the non-zero values of the uh, different rows start. So if this is our original dense matrix, remember that we are going to store all elements belonging to the same row of the matrix uh, together next to each other. Uh, we need to store not only the value uh, of the element, but also the column where it decides. And then we have this uh, array uh, of pointers to where each of the rows start. This is one of the um, compression formats that we can also use uh, for uh, graphs as we are going to discuss, not the only one, but uh, we will use it uh, uh, for reference. So let's start talking about graph search. We could also call it graph traversal in general graph processing or graph analytics. And graphs are very important data structures, as sparse data structures, as uh, you probably know, and as we are going to see um, in this lecture and very uh, important for many uh, modern applications. Uh, graph uh, processing or graph analytics are a way of performing dynamic data extraction. This, is, uh, this happens when the data to be processed in each phase of the computation needs to be dynamically determined and extracted from a bulk data structure. For example, think about a graph, think about uh, how it looks. We are going to see uh, a representation of a graph in a couple of slides. But if you think about a graph, you will see that it's uh, pretty regular in its shape. So as we make progress exploring this graph, the amount of computation is going to change. Um, so graph algorithms are popular examples that perform dynamic data structure uh, extraction. And these graph algorithms are useful in many different applications. One of the applications that we are going to mention today uh, is um, electronic design automation. And in particular, we are going to focus today on a simple algorithm, but very important uh, graph processing algorithm and very uh, typical graph processing pattern that is uh, breadth first search or BFS. But before we talk, start talking about more about graphs and about BFS, let me um, remind you what are main challenges of dynamic data extraction. So um, one uh, issue or one uh, challenge that we have here is that uh, the input data needs to be organized for locality, coalescing, and contention avoidance as much as possible. And we will see that this is not always uh, easy. It, it uh, really entails uh, some challenges because of the irregularity of the data structures that we are going to handle. Now, and the second point here is that the amount of work and level of parallelism often grow and shrink during execution. Why is that? Because as we make progress uh, over the course of the execution of a graph processing algorithm, we will um, uh, arrive uh, to different parts of the algorithm, some of them be more than, different parts of the graph, sorry, some of them be more dense, some of them be more sparse, because we will have nodes that will have more neighbors and other nodes that won't have so many neighbors or maybe don't have any neighbors at all, right? So the amount of computation is changing a lot and the amount of parallelism that is available for parallelization um, uh, changes a lot of, as well. There might be ways of implementing efficiently, at least from a, programming, uh, a programmer's perspective, uh, uh, interesting ways of uh, uh, programming uh, these kind of algorithms. One way is dynamic parallelism. Dynamic parallelism is a, um, is a, a GPU computing paradigm that we haven't covered yet uh, in these lectures, but uh, we are going to discuss it in a later lecture. So now let's uh, start talking about graphs and graph processing and BFS as our sample algorithm. As usual, please uh, let me know if there are any questions. I will also keep an eye on the YouTube chat in case that uh, there are some uh, questions there that is uh, worth discussing. So let's uh, use this simple graph as our 
uh, running uh, graph uh, uh, example. Notice that uh, this graph in total has uh, nine nodes. Notice also that uh, these, the edges that connect the nodes are directed, meaning that they are arrows. So they start here and they go to here. Uh, and what that means is that this uh, edge is not bi uh, bidirectional. We are uh, considering it this way. If we uh, were uh, using a graph with non-directed graphs, uh, non-directed edges, sorry, um, we uh, could also apply the same techniques that we are going to explain today. The only difference is that instead of having one adjacency matrix, we may have two adjacency matrices. But anyway, let's focus on this specific case. And first of all, let me uh, define what's the adjacency matrix. The adjacency matrix is a, a simple way to represent the graph, to store the graph in memory. Observe that um, uh, here we have um, uh, uh, here we have the, the, the rows that go from uh, zero to eight and also the columns that go from uh, zero to eight as well. And each of them represent a node. So uh, when we are in row zero, what we store in row zero are the edges to uh, all other, uh, to, to all the neighbors of uh, node zero. So if we are in node zero or vertex zero, the neighbors of this uh, vertex zero or the successors of this vertex zero, because uh, seven is also a neighbor, but it's a predecessor. So we don't consider it uh, for um, in the, the particular algorithm that we are going to apply here. Uh, so if you observe zero, its neighbors or its successors are node one and node two. So um, uh, that's the reason why in this row zero of the adjacency matrix, we have one here and we have one here corresponding to nodes or vertices one and two. If we think about uh, node one, we see that it na its neighbors are three and four. And that's exactly what we can see in row one of the adjacency matrix. But now, uh, yeah, if you think about this matrix, it's uh, highly sparse, right? And we already know that uh, sparse matrices, we are already familiar with the sparse matrices, and we know that uh, sparse matrices are very useful. Actually, recall uh, this uh, uh, slide that I showed you in the previous lecture. In this um, slide, uh, yeah, I mentioned that uh, sparse matrices are very useful in, for example, recommender systems, graph analytics, or neural networks. And here is exactly where we are in graph analytics. And uh, today we will cover in more detail this uh, breadth first search algorithm. Recall as well that uh, uh, sparse matrices, and as I said, uh, before in the in the introduction uh, of the lecture uh, are normally stored in memory in a compressed way and a common uh, a widely used uh, compressed format is the compressed sparse row format or CSR. In CSR, as I said before, we store non-zeros of the row adjacently. So all these guys here are non-zeros of row zero. These guys here are non-zeros of row one, row one and so on. And then we have an array of uh, row pointers that point to the, um, each, each pointer in this array point to where the uh, non-zeros of the corresponding row start. So let's use this kind of representation for our graph at, uh, as well, for our, our adjacency matrix. Um, Observe that same as we do in the CSR format for sparse matrices in the previous slide, we can do exactly the same here because the adjacency matrix is just a, a sparse matrix. So we are going to have a, uh, an array of row pointers. We are, we are going to call it source in this um, lecture. Uh, we have an array of column indices that we call destination, source and destination, because those are the uh, the, the extremes of the of the edges, right? So uh, the, for this edge here, node zero is the source, node one is the destination. And that's why uh, we stored them uh, this way. So row pointers or this, the source array point to the place where the neighbors of one particular node, one particular row in this adjacency matrix start. And then we also have an array of non-zero elements that we call data in this lecture. But uh, one simplification that we can already do for this particular graph, this is a non-weighted graph. That means that all edges have the same value. The value of all edges is uh, exactly one. And actually for the BFS algorithm, what we do is counting the number of hops uh, between 
uh, one uh, source node and one destination node. So in the end, all hops are exactly the same value, value one. And uh, because of that, we can simplify this representation and we don't need to uh, store for this particular example, uh, these uh, array of non-zero elements. If the, these were weighted uh, edges and, and each of them had a different value, for example, uh, imagine um, 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 a graph representing uh, a, a network of roads uh, and uh, storing information about how busy a specific road, uh, a specific road is, um, we could represent uh, that level of uh, traffic uh, with, a, with a weight assigned to the uh, corresponding edge. And, and those um, roads that are, let's say, quite free, not many cars uh, on them, could have a very low weight, while others maybe from here to here uh, would have a lot of traffic and probably had a very, uh, a very uh, high weight. But yeah, this is uh, not the example that we are going to cover today. Something a little bit simpler, uh, all non-zero elements are equal one. So that's why we can directly ignore this uh, array data. But now let's uh, start talking about our algorithm, breadth research or BFS. The goal of BFS is to determine the minimal number of hops that is required to go from a source node to a destination node or to all destination nodes. So if you think about the uh, graph that we have in the previous slide, the desirable outcome of BFS for this uh, particular graph is something like, this, something like this in the case where the source node is node zero. So note that uh, next to each vertex, uh, we have uh, also uh, added a number that represents the distance from the vertex, from the source node uh, to the corresponding node. So for example, the distance from the distance from node zero to node zero is zero for obvious reasons. The distance from node zero to nodes one and two is one, or to these uh, green guys here, three, four, five, and six distance is two. And to this uh, uh, last node eight, the distance is three. And how do we execute this algorithm? It's an iterative algorithm. We have to start uh, with a source node, and then we go um, uh, iteration after iteration, uh, visiting nodes that are at a certain distance. Uh, one hop, two hops, three hops, and so on. So when we start, we only know the distance to the source node. And we know that the distance from the source node to itself is zero, right? But, but for the rest of nodes that we have in the graph, we don't know what's the distance because we haven't explored the graph uh, yet. That's why we mark, we can uh, use here like um, infinity or maybe minus one that is a, um, uh, an invalid value for a distance, right? So this is where, uh, where we start. This is the initial condition. What we do uh, in the uh, first iteration of the algorithm is visiting the nodes that are direct neighbors or successors of uh, node zero. In this case, for this particular graph and this particular source node, the uh, first neighbors are node one and node two. And observe that uh, we call them the frontier. The frontier meaning that after every iteration, we have visited a new set of nodes that are neighbors from the previously visited nodes that have not been yet visited. For example, node one and node two are neighbors of node zero and in the beginning, they were not visited, right? So because they were not visited, now they take part of the frontier. So this is our first frontier. In the second iteration, or uh, nodes in level two, we visit nodes that are a distance two hops from the source. And in this case, uh, we discover all the neighbors of uh, uh, row uh, of uh, node one and node two. And these neighbors are nodes three, four, five, six, seven, and these, uh, five guys represent the next frontier. And in the third iteration, three hops, uh, we uh, discover and visit the last node that is uh, this node eight. If our graph were uh, larger, probably we would need a few more or many more iterations, but and that's uh, the desirable outcome uh, for this uh, simple graph uh, where uh, with a source node uh, equal node, node zero. And uh, yeah, you, you have already seen how we apply iteration after iteration. 
But the solution to the breadth first search algorithm or the outcome of the breadth first search algorithm depends on the graph and depends on the node that we use as a source. For example, if we now the source is node two, the output, the outcome is completely different. We visit different nodes in the first frontier, uh, other nodes in the second frontier, other nodes in the uh, third frontier, and so on. We actually have four frontiers here because the last uh, two nodes that we will visit are this node three and uh, node four, as you can see. So the fact that the outcome is also going to be so different depending on simply what's the source node that we are considering uh, will make that parallelizing this algorithm and implementing it, for example, on a, on a GPU is not a straightforward. It really um, entail, entails many different challenges because the way that the uh, data that is extracted uh, from the algorithm, from the data structure uh, evolves over iterations, changes completely. Going back to the previous slides, uh, we see that the size of the frontier here is two, then is five, then is one. If we uh, check uh, node zero, we see that the size of the frontier is three, then is two, and then is one. So as you see, the, the amount of computation changes uh, depending on the uh, a specific uh, case that we are studying and, and depending also as well on how this uh, specific use case uh, evolves. Okay, but let's uh, start thinking and discussing about uh, how we are going to make use uh, of the data structures that represent the graph when it comes to uh, applying the BFS uh, algorithm. So uh, imagine that uh, we have the uh, same uh, simple graph and uh, imagine that now we are processing frontier number two. So the first, uh, in the very beginning we were here, we discovered where, what, what are the uh, uh, direct neighbors of uh, these node two, these are uh, five, six, uh, and seven, this is our first frontier. And right after that, uh, we uh, go to the second frontier. And in the second frontier, we have node zero and node eight. So in this second iteration of the algorithm, what we have when we start the iteration is the input frontier. This input frontier of the second iteration of the algorithm is uh, pretty short in this case. It only has uh, two nodes. Uh, in the frontier and these nodes are node zero and node A. So how are we going to parallelize these on our GP? Uh, one uh, potential way of doing this is assigning uh, each of the nodes in the frontier to a different thread. So here we could have uh, one thread uh, being in charge of this node zero, another thread being in charge on, of this node eight. And now what is what these threads need to do? What these threads need to do is trying to find the neighbors of the corresponding nodes in the frontier. So for example, as you see in the graph, for node zero, the neighbors are node one and node two, uh, and node eight doesn't have any neighbors or doesn't have any uh, successors, as you see. So <clears throat> we start uh, going uh, to the source array where we have the sources of the edges and look for uh, node zero. So uh, the uh, node zero is here and we know that the number of neighbors that we will have to visit for this source zero is two because that's the distance between two consecutive elements of this source uh, pointer array, right? So this one corresponds to node one, this one corresponds to node zero. What this means, the distance is two, is that node zero has two neighbors. And where do we find these two neighbors? We will find it in the, in the destination array. By the way, regarding uh, a, a node A, there is not much to do, right? Because the thread assigned here will go to the corresponding uh, pointer of the source array and we'll see that the value of this pointer is the same as the last pointer of the array, which means that uh, node A don't ha doesn't have any neighbors or successors. So let's focus on node zero. Uh, after uh, finding what are the uh, uh, nodes that are the destination from node zero, we know that they are one and two. And now uh, what we will do is checking in an array called label that essentially contains information about what 
nodes have been visited or what nodes are not visited. Essentially, this label here, this label array contains these uh, numbers that uh, we have in the graph next to the to the corresponding nodes. This is, these are the values for the final outcome. And, 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 and here we are only in the second iteration. So that's why not all elements of label have the final value yet. Uh, but uh, yeah, so what we will have to do is go into the corresponding uh, element of label. In this case, this is the position that corresponds to destination node one. This is the position that corresponds to destination node two. And, uh, and we compare the value of this label with the value of the uh, iteration that uh, we will uh, start next. Because now we are in the second iteration, in the third iteration, we may have to um, analyze, to, to study the neighbors of, uh, of these uh, node zero that fall in, the, in that uh, corresponding um, frontier. So if we check uh, the first of them, node two, we see that the label is zero. Why is that? Because node two is the source uh, in this uh, BFS example, right? And uh, if we compare three to zero, we see that zero is uh, smaller than three. So what that means is that this node has been visited already. We don't uh, uh, need to change that. Uh, it's, uh, it's the source node. So there is no point in finding the source node with a longer uh, path than, than zero. But uh, however, for the other one, for node one, what we see is that um, uh, minus one is an invalid value. And now we are visiting node one for the first time. And the distance from node two uh, to, uh, the, the, to node one is three. And actually, if you look at node two here, you'll see that the distance from node two to node one is one hop, two hops, three hops. Okay, as I said uh, before, BFS is a widely used algorithm in many different applications. For example, in the, like, um, uh, um, like uh, this, uh, how it's called, like driving assistance tools, for example, where you have uh, all the rows of a, of a city or, or, or a region or something, and you want to calculate what's the shortest path, the, 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 the shortest way of reaching from one uh, source to some uh, destination, you can use BFS or you can use SSSP, a single source shortest path to this a very uh, similar algorithm. And I also mentioned that uh, BFS is widely using electronic design automation in order to find what's the most efficient way of, uh, of uh, linking uh, two net terminals using uh, wires. Uh, imagine that this is your, <coughs> your PCB and here, uh, you need to uh, find a way of connecting this net terminal here to this net terminal here. So the way to go is applying some algorithm like BFS that gives us the distance and the best way to go from here to here, right? And after we know that we would be able to uh, identify the uh, fastest path to reach uh, from one point to another point. So this is just one example, uh, one use case of BFS. If you want to uh, know more details uh, about uh, this specific use case, I recommend you to uh, take a look at this paper. But we are talking today about how to implement this BFS algorithm and other uh, graph processing algorithms on parallel uh, machines, right? Like a, a GPU, for example. When it comes to uh, uh, proposing implementations for uh, parallel algorithms, one thing that uh, we have to uh, look at is the, is the uh, complexity of the algorithm because that relates to the execution time or the running time needed for the uh, execution of a particular algorithm or a particular problem. And um, uh, we might very easily uh, design uh, parallel algorithms that are not uh, work efficient or have more complexity than what is needed. Um, for example, if you think about an algorithm with complexity n square and compare it to a, an algorithm with complexity n log n, you'll see that depending on what's the size of the input, depending on the problem size, one of them uh, will provide more performance than, a different, than the other one, right? And actually for very uh, small problems, what we can easily see in this graph is that uh, the quadratic algorithm, the n-square algorithm, is in reality faster than the n-log n algorithm. 
right? But at a certain point, the n log n, the, 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 the running time of the uh, n log n algorithm keeps increasing linearly, while uh, in the case of n square, it's a quadratic increase. So at some point, uh, for large problem sizes, n square algorithms are not um, a good choice. And this is something that may happen uh, when implementing parallel algorithms on uh, GPU, especially if the implementation of these algorithms is challenging, as happens with uh, irregular uh, algorithms like uh, graph processing. Uh, and we are going to see a couple of examples that uh, fall in uh, this problem. And maybe if uh, you were going to use a very small uh, problem size, it could be fine. But uh, probably that won't be the case where uh, that we are going to where we are going to use a GPU, right? So we normally use GPUs that are um, uh, devices with a massive amount uh, of uh, parallelism, a massive uh, compute power. We normally um, use them when we have uh, large problems because this way we can parallelize more and take more advantage of the available resources. But let me uh, mention some. Uh, um, possible implementations of the BFS, algor BFS algorithm that fall into uh, this problem of the uh, quadratic uh, complexity. Uh, one possible implementation, if we have uh, something like this, imagine that our graph has, uh, our graphs has uh, nine nodes um, as we have here. And one thing that we could do is statically assigning one thread to each of the nodes. Uh, so all nodes are going to be visited in all iterations, and um, in every iteration, uh, every thread examines the neighbor nodes to determine if its node will be a frontier node in the next phase, right? So in every single iteration, the corresponding thread checks the node, checks the neighbors, and sees if uh, uh, it, the, the, these neighbors are going to be uh, in the next frontier. Right. Um, the problem, if we do that, is that in many cases, for example, uh, remember this, uh, I mean, this could be one frontier with uh, composed by nodes uh, five, six, and seven. Um, the, the problem is that in each iteration, the only active threads are going to be those that are um, assigned to the uh, vertices that we, or nodes that we really have in the frontier, right? So out of nine threads in this example, only three nodes are uh, active and only three threads are active. So as you see, a pretty inefficient use of the resources. Um, in the next frontier, we discover uh, neighbors eight and zero, and uh, they are uh, here in the next frontier. In this case, it's only two threads uh, that are going to be uh, active uh, for this particular example, right? Um, this implementation might work well for specific graphs, maybe not too large, maybe graphs that are not pretty dense, let's say, where uh, nodes usually have many neighbors. Uh, and, and in those cases, uh, we will probably have much more utilization of the threads assigned to the, uh, to the frontier, uh, but uh, I mean, to the nodes of the graph, uh, but uh, that's probably not the general case. Another, um, Implementation, completely different one, but also falling into uh, similar problems as well, is uh, this matrix-based parallelization. In this case, the uh, propagation that is moving from one frontier to the next frontier is done through a matrix vector uh, multiplication. And um, this uh, essentially is uh, starting from the adjacency matrix and uh, having also a vector that represents the vertices that are active at a certain point. So imagine that we have a, a graph as simple as this one with only uh, three nodes and, and two edges. Um, we have an edge that goes from S to U. We have an edge that goes from S to U. That's why we have one here in the adjacency matrix. And we have another edge that goes from uh, U to V. So that's why we have one here in this uh, element of the adjacency matrix. And uh, in the current uh, frontier, we only have this node S. So that's what uh, we have here in the vector, and now we perform an SPMB, a sparse matrix vector multiply. The only um, observation here is that uh, the matrix is uh, transpose. So in reality, it's not row by column, but column by vector, right? And, um, and uh, yeah, but by performing this SPMB 
operation, we obtain this output array that indicates that the value in the frontier, uh, the node in the frontier right now is node U. So is this efficient? This, this might be efficient again for uh, relatively dense graphs and maybe graphs that are not uh, too large, but uh, the problem is the complexity as well. We are going through all ages, edges in every single level, in every single iteration of the algorithm, and that's why the complexity is quadratic. But the fact that this specific example uh, had um, this uh, quadratic complexity doesn't mean that uh, you know, using um, SPMB and uh, linear algebra for the resolution of uh, graphs is not possible. And actually, it's uh, one of the ways of uh, implementing uh, graph algorithms is uh, basing them on the use of sparse matrices and sparse uh, matrix operation. That's uh, what we normally call the linear algebraic formulation of graph algorithms. And I want to give you uh, one very um, simple and brief example today. Um, imagine that we have this simple graph. This is the logical representation of the graph. And this is the adjacency matrix. Note that in this specific example, we are using weighted ages. And uh, the way to process uh, this graph uh, by using uh, this uh, linear algebraic formulation is uh, this uh, vertex programming model that uh, was uh, proposed in the past and it has been followed by uh, many recent research works. And um, as we will see in this uh, vertex uh, programming model, we're going to see an example, uh, example for the single source shortest path algorithm in this um, um, vertex programming model, what we do is expressing the algorithm itself, the graph processing algorithm itself as a generalized SPMB, a sparse matrix vector multiplication. However, it's, we call it generalized because we are changing the operations that we use depending on the algorithm. For example, for SSSP, uh, what we do is replacing the multiplication with additions and replacing the addition with a minimum. So let's see an example. Here you see, uh, this is our uh, graph in the initial state where uh, in, in SSP, we, we essentially operate very similar to BFS. We go visiting node by node. We visit the neighbors, uh, the unvisited neighbors uh, of nodes and, and, and calculate what's distant to a source. So in this uh, example, the source is A and we want to know the distance for this weighted graph. Uh, to the uh, to the other nodes uh, of the graph. So in the iteration zero, uh, we start with the current frontier. The current frontier is uh, only, uh, I mean, is the, is the current status of the of the distances. So we know that the distance from A to A is zero. That the distance to the rest of uh, nodes of the graph is uh, infinity. And we also have the uh, adjacency matrix uh, here. So remember. We need to execute a SPMB um, operation, but instead of using multiplication, we are going to use add. So um, at, at, at all these values uh, don't count because they are uh, all zero. Uh, the values that don't count are those values that are non-zeros. So uh, when we uh, operate on this row and the vector, we will obtain that the addition of this value here one and this value here zero uh, is one, right? And that's uh, and that's uh, essentially what we do. Uh, we uh, for the for the next row in this case addition of zero and three is uh, is three, so that's what we store here. Observe that in this particular case, because from the multiplication that is from these additions are only uh, obtaining a single. Uh, element single value per row, the reduction applying uh, minimum is uh, is obvious. But uh, in these uh, in these other case, uh, we uh, perform the addition and then we have to uh, compute uh, the minimum using um, these. Uh, I mean, compute the reduction using uh, taking the minimum uh, result of the multiplications that in reality are additions. But as you see, it's an iterative algorithm as usual. It has um, some advantages due to the fact that it's uh, relatively easy to represent, use well-known algorithms that uh, may map well to uh, many or some uh, um, uh, parallel architectures.
But still, even though this uh, linear algebraic formulation is useful, uh, we still want to uh, try something else, like a more general technique that can be uh, efficient to handle uh, many uh, types of graphs, and, um, and 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 we can have like more specialized formulations and specialized optimizations when we have more uh, particular or specific requirements uh, in our graphs. The technique that we are going to explain today is called top-down, vertex-centric top-down approach. Um, and it's a queue-based implementation of the parallel algorithm, of the parallel uh, BFS algorithm. In this queue-based implementation, we are going to use kind of a hierarchy of queues as you will see, and we are also going to use a hierarchy of kernels, of uh, GPU kernels. So we will use different GPU kernels for the computation of an iteration, depending on what are the characteristics of the current frontier that we um, have to um, explore. As I said, we are going to we are going to start talking about a queue-based formulation of the BFS algorithm. And we can do an initial attempt that maybe is not going to be very successful, but at least we already know that the complexity is lower than uh, in the previous attempts that uh, we have seen in previous slides. Um, we are going to have a frontier, an initial frontier uh, at the beginning of every iteration. Those are the nodes that we have to visit and we have to, um, uh, to check what are they, their neighbors. Um, so to do so, uh, we will have uh, certain nodes in the frontier. We assign uh, one thread to each of the nodes in the frontier. So we are doing this parallel DQ. And now we start uh, checking what are the neighbors. So for example, for node zero, there are no neighbors. For node six, there is only one neighbor of this node eight. For uh, node seven, there is one neighbor that is node zero. So we have also, after each uh, or, or at the end of one iteration, we will have an output frontier that we have generated when visiting the neighbors of the current frontier. So let's uh, let's see how uh, we create uh, the frontier here. Um, we would have this uh, thread here um, storing in the output frontier the neighbor of node six this thread here is storing in the frontier the neighbor of node seven, right? And uh, what happens when we have two threads trying to access at the same time, uh, the same memory location, we have a conflict. And um, if we have a conflict, uh, this cannot work well because both uh, threads are going to try to uh, update the same memory position and, uh, and the result won't be correct. So we have to use atomic operations uh, as uh, we know from uh, previous lectures. And by using atomic operations, we will store the um, neighbors, uh, node zero and node eight in the right position. When I'm saying we use atomic operations, this is different from the way we have used atomic operations in the histogram calculation. Remember that in histogram calculation, we use atomic operations to update the output itself to update each of the beams of the histogram. These counters, right, that count the number of occurrences that we have for certain for the values in in the in the input. Uh, in this case, the atomic operations are on a single variable that is kind of a shared counter uh, among all the threads running on the GPU. And this counter is um, is just uh, as I said, is one variable that contains. Uh, the number of uh, nodes that have been enqueued in the um, uh, output uh, frontier, right? Uh, so we have the atomic variable here. This thread goes, updates atomically the variable, obtains um, an index, and this index is the position where uh, this thread will have to store node zero. Uh, this other guy goes and uses the atomic operation on this uh, variable, this atomic variable, and then finds and gets a, a new index, in this case one, and here is where we store um, this, um, uh, this uh, node eight, right? And this uh, is the way that we create the output frontier. We create it in a correct way, but with the uh, overhead, the natural overhead of the execution of atomic operations that, as you know, serialize the execution and may make that we uh, get no speed up from this parallel implementation. So let's see how we can optimize uh, this implementation in order to make it more efficient. 
One potential way would be to get rid completely of atomic operations, uh, but uh, in order to do so, we will need to pre-allocate some space in the frontier, in the output frontier, for uh, vertices to store their neighbors whenever uh, it's needed, whenever these uh, neighbors uh, are going to be visited. For example, here in the current frontier, we have nodes D, T, and X. In the next frontier, we have nodes U and Y. We have pre-allocated some space, in, let's say two uh, possible neighbors for a V, T, and X in the output frontier, but it turns out that only uh, U and Y will be in the, in the output frontier in the end, right? So after propagating, after writing the neighbors to visit in the next iteration here, we have to compact uh, so that we uh, save memory space and get rid of these uh, uh, empty uh, memory positions, right? So problem is that uh, we have to pre-allocate probably a lot of space and the space that uh, we likely are not going to use. And we may have nodes that have many, many neighbors, or maybe they need uh, hundreds or thousands of, uh, of uh, positions for pre-allocation, while we will have other neighbors, for example, node B that don't have uh, any neighbor, right? So I'm not going to allocate, pre I mean, it's not a good idea to pre-allocate uh, thousands of uh, uh, positions in the output frontier for a node that will likely uh, we will probably don't don't won't write anything right but it's a way of uh, skipping avoiding the usage of uh, atomic operations so when we have atomic operations what we have to think about is how to optimize the usage and uh, we already know one technique that is called privatization we are going to use it in a different way as we have explained before uh, the way that we will use it in this case is by having several output private uh, output uh, data structures that will be later merged. But unlike the case of the histogram where we update the subhistograms themselves directly with the atomic operations, in this case, we only update with atomic operations one variable that is the counter that is going to give us the index uh, where we need to write um, the uh, node uh, uh, in the output frontier. And essentially the idea here of the privatization is to privatize the queues, uh, privatize also these uh, counters that uh, will give us these uh, atomic counters that will give us uh, the index. And, um, and we can have also like uh, multiple uh, levels uh, in this uh, hierarchy of queues, but, um, but let's say the, 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 the the basic uh, implementation here is to assign one local frontier per thread block. This local frontier will likely be in shared memory. And after these local frontiers are ready, we will uh, spill them onto the global frontier that will likely reside in uh, global memory. So when the um, execution starts, each thread processes one or more frontier nodes and inserts the new frontier uh, nodes in its private queue, its private output queue. Uh, as, as you see here, this uh, Q1, Q2, Q3, and so on. And after um, one frontier, one local frontier is ready, is completed because we have already visited all the nodes of this neighbor, uh, all, all the neighbors of this node or all the neighbors of all the nodes being processed by one particular uh, thread block, then uh, we have to find the place for, let's say, these three elements here, or these uh, three nodes here, or this one node here uh, in the output frontier, right? And to do so, uh, we can probably do it in different ways, but we can also have like a global counter uh, where uh, each of the thread blocks update find an index and write in the corresponding position. So note how this A will go here, this B will go here, this C will go here. Uh, this position here is for G and this position here is for, for H. How do we calculate the index where we will store H? We use the offset of Q2 that uh, we have obtained after updating a global variable. And uh, then we add the uh, index um, 
uh, in, in, inside the, the, the queue, the local queue itself, right? In this case, the index is one, so we add one to the offset of uh, queue two. And as I said, uh, we uh, hopefully will store uh, the local queues in the faster memory space that is the on-chip uh, shared memory. And, uh, and this uh, block queue or this local queue is only go going to be updated by threads belonging to the uh, same block. And then the global queue will be uh, populated when uh, the thread blocks uh, complete. And global queue uh, will be in the global memory. So problems that may, we may have here, of course, we still have collision on the VQs because we need to update an atomic variable and all threads running in this block uh, will update this atomic variable whenever they need a, a neighbor to enqueue in the output queue. Uh, so that's um, how we may have some uh, collision on the VQs and, uh, and this thread updating an atomic variable in shared memory may uh, have uh, a lot of contention. But notice that this is just like a simplest case, a tool level hierarchy, but we could also have more levels in the hierarchy as well, right? Uh, we could apply uh, another level for warps. This way we would have uh, one local queue for a whole warp. And in that case, we won't need um, so many uh, atomic operations on the same variable. So not so much contention. And, and we could even have like thread level uh, thread level queues have every thread having its own uh, small queue where we don't even need to use atomic operations anymore because it's private to each individual thread. We are explaining, let's say, like the basic approach um, to the, uh, we're explaining the basic approach to this uh, hierarchical uh, queue management, but as I said, we can increase the number of levels and add more levels in order to reduce the contention even more. Advantages and limitations of this uh, hierarchical queue management scheme. Uh, this technique can be applied to any inherent sequential data structure as long as the exact global ordering between queue contents is not required for correctness or optimality. What does it mean? It means that when uh, each of these uh, BQs is ready, is complete, we have to copy it to the output queue. But we don't know in advance what's the uh, precise place where we will copy it. We have to update a global variable. And the way we update this, uh, this global variable is uh, with an atomic addition that is uh, associative and it's commutative. Um, so the uh, order of the execution doesn't matter, uh, but uh, the, the, the downside of that is that this VQ might fall here or might fall here or might fall here. So one thing that we have to guarantee to apply this technique is that the global ordering of the elements of the output queue is not important for uh, correctness. Then the global queue, the, the, the local queues, the VQs um, have another uh, issue or have another challenge that we have to figure out in some way how to solve. That is the limited capacity of the shared memory. Um, <clears throat> We may do different things here. For example, if we uh, would know uh, what's going to be the, uh, the number, uh, I mean, the amount of memory that we need per, per block or per thread, uh, we could adjust it, but uh, we need to have some information uh, about the input graph. In the worst case, we can have a kind of an overflow mechanism. In the overflow mechanism, uh, what we do is uh, every time that we enqueue something in the local queue, we check what's the remaining capacity. And when we are approaching the remaining capacity, we could stop, we could tell all threads of the thread block to offload, to spill the current contents of the local queue into the global queue, and then return and continue the discovery of uh, new neighbors and new nodes to incorporate to the output frontier. So that would be a way of implementing an um, overflow mechanism. So now we know how to uh, deal more or less with this uh, hierarchical queue management. Now let's talk about the kernel arrangement. What happens in iterative algorithms like this one? Uh, in the end, what happens in these algorithms is that if we are using many threads, many thread blocks, and um, we have a GPU with a certain number of GPU cores, the way that these thread blocks are scheduled onto the available cores is um, not deterministic in principle. We don't know um, how these, um, in which order these thread blocks are executed on the uh, GPU cores. So what that means is that 
uh, whenever we have uh, the output frontier, whenever we complete the iteration, we need to uh, terminate the uh, current kernel because that's the only way to synchronize across uh, thread blocks, right? Uh, the terminating the kernel is the only way of making sure that these elements, uh, these nodes in the output frontier are already in global memory. We can only know that uh, if we terminate the kernel. When we terminate the kernel, we are 100% sure that all threads uh, did their job, all threads wrote whatever they had to write uh, to global memory, and now we can start the next iteration, right? And the next iteration requires a new kernel call, and uh, we will discover new neighbors that will go to the output frontier, but before starting the next iteration, we will still, we will again have to uh, terminate um, uh, the kernel and start a new kernel. So in the end, this is too much overhead. Why is that? Because kernel termination and relaunch is costly. It might not be extremely costly if uh, the amount of computation of the kernel is uh, large enough, but in other cases where the kernel doesn't really last for so long, it's more difficult to amortize this cost of terminating the kernel, returning the, the control to the uh, host CPU and launching uh, a new kernel, right? Um, there are possible solutions to deal with this. Uh, one of the first solutions that we are going to uh, talk about is to use the uh, partial um, intra-block um, uh, synchronization, but there might be other ways. Dynamic parallelism is also another way that we will cover in a later lecture or uh, something that we are going to mention briefly today is as well the usage of persistent threads. Uh, but yeah, let's uh, go with the first of these possible solutions that is based on the um, uh, like inter intra block uh, synchronization. But uh, in order for the uh, algorithm to work well, to uh, to um, I mean to to really be able to process all frontiers, regardless of what's the size of the frontier, um, we need to uh, come up with some uh, hierarchical kernel arrangement. Uh, observe, and actually, if you look at the um, sample graphs that we have seen before, notice that uh, in the beginning of the execution of the, of the uh, BFS algorithm, because we start from a single node, the size of the frontiers is expected to be shorter, right? So in, in, in our example, node zero had only uh, two neighbors and node two uh, had also uh, two neighbors as well, uh, if I recall correctly. So the number of neighbors is pretty small in the initial iterations of the algorithms. And, um, and if that happens, then we may not need to use like the whole GPU, right? It might be enough to use uh, a single thread block uh, for the uh, execution. So that's what we can do in our hierarchical kernel arrangement. When we start the execution of the graph processing algorithm, uh, we use a simple kernel that uses a single thread block. And the good thing of, uh, of that is that uh, iteration after iteration, we can synchronize the threads in the same thread block using sync threads, using the intra-block synchronization. The, uh, because we are doing that, we don't need to terminate the kernel at all. We can imagine that we start with a single, uh, single node in the frontier, node zero, we visit it, it has two neighbors, uh, nodes uh, one and two, and then and so we synchronize using sync threads, go to the next iteration, visit the neighbors of uh, node one and node two. Maybe now we have four neighbors in the frontier and so on. Probably the size of the frontier will keep increasing as we make progress uh, through the graph. And at some point we will have to uh, terminate this kernel because we cannot handle the frontier anymore with the uh, number, the short, uh, small number of threads uh, that we have in a single block, right? And I mean, we could do it, but for sure, it would be pretty inefficient because we would need to go through a very long frontier using a thing, single thread block. At some point, that doesn't make sense. We have enough work to keep more GPU cores busy. So uh, at that point, what makes sense is to terminate the kernel, launch a new kernel that in this case will be our kernel two that is based on kernel termination and relaunch. So this kernel two starts, we have or frontier, maybe the size of the frontiers is, um, is millions of nodes. Uh, we launch as many uh, thread blocks as we need. These, the threads of these thread blocks visit all the 
nodes in the current frontier, as I said, very long frontier, they generate an output frontier and then we terminate the kernel to make sure that all thread clocks are done and start the new iteration with the new frontier, the output frontier that now will become the input frontier. Uh, advantage of this hierarchical kernel arrangement is that uh, as long as the uh, amount of computation, as long as the frontier is relatively small, we don't have to terminate the kernel and we can be more efficient. Let's take a closer look at this uh, kernel one for small frontiers. As I said, we only launch a single block. So we only use a GPU core. We use as many threads in this block as uh, we need, depending on what's the size of the uh, input frontier that would be here. Is we have some dummy threads or completely idle threads. Uh, these working threads uh, propagate and generate the local queue. And then we use sync threads when this local queue is uh, complete. We go to the next level, that is the next iteration. And we use as many threads as we need here. Uh, we generate uh, a new frontier uh, that is stored in the V queue, in the output queue. And then next level and so on. So at some point, uh, the size of this queue will be so large that uh, it doesn't make sense anymore to use this simple kernel because as I said, we are only using a single uh, GPU core, but uh, while the frontier is pretty short, uh, it's uh, like a very uh, good solution because we don't need to update any global queue. We don't need uh, global memory accesses. We don't need atomic operations in global memory. So it can be pretty fast, even though we are using a single uh, GPU core. But then at some point, as I said, we will have to go to the next level of the hierarchy of kernels. In this case, kernel two for big size frontiers. Remember that here we launch a kernel with as many threads as we need. Uh, we compute an output frontier and then we terminate the kernel to make sure that we perform a coarse grain synchronization here. All threads, uh, all thread blocks get synchronized. We have a new output frontier. This output frontier is the input frontier of the next iteration. And then we launch as many threads as we need, right? So imagine that uh, the input frontier of one particular iteration is, uh, uh, it's uh, for example, two to the 20 in size. So in that case, we could launch, for example, 2 to the 10 times 2 to the 10. So we could uh, launch 1024, uh, a number of 1,024 thread blocks of 1,024 1, threads in size. But if these guys go and generate an output frontier with, uh, let's say, 2 to the 30, in that case, we may need a million or 2 to the 20 um, thread blocks of 1,024 threads. So good thing of this uh, kernel, this um, uh, kernel two for big size frontiers is that we can adapt as well how many thread blocks we launch depending on what's the uh, size of the frontier that we are analyzing. And that's um, uh, one way of implementing uh, this kernel. Another way uh, of uh, implementing this hierarchical approach would be to use dynamic parallelism. I'm publicizing dynamic parallelism a, a lot but we are not going to talk about it today. We will talk in, uh, in a later lecture, but we will cover it in this course for sure. So in summary, uh, the hierarchical kernel arrangement will use whatever kernel is the most appropriate depending on what's the size of the frontier to visit in each iteration. As I said, I, I, as I said before, the main disadvantage of uh, this uh, kernel uh, termination and relaunch technique to make sure that we synchronize uh, between frontiers. The main uh, issue is that we waste a lot of time terminating the kernel, returning the control to the CPU, starting a new kernel, and so on. So I'm going to present uh, some technique uh, that avoids this kernel termination and relaunch, and it's called persistent thread blocks. Uh, observe that uh, in the implementation that we just explained for kernel two, um, we uh, launch as many thread blocks as we need, depending on what's the size of the frontier. In kernel two, we launch a number of thread blocks that is frontier size divided by a block size. For example, I gave you the example of, um, I have a frontier size uh, equal to two to the 20. I want to use blocks of uh, 1,024 threads. So the total number of blocks that I'm going to launch is 1,024 as well. And how are these blocks scheduled onto the available course? 
whenever there is a free slot in one core or one streaming multiprocessor or SM, uh, I place the uh, block in the free slot. Um, we can assume, for example, that um, we have a GPU, very small GPU with only two cores, and each of the cores can hold, can execute concurrently two thread blocks. So here we map block zero, block one to SM0, block two, block three to SM1. When one of these four guys finish the computation, finishes the computation of its own uh, local queue, it will retire, I mean, it will uh, spill the contents of the local queue into the global queue, and then it will retire and another thread block, let's say block four, block five, block six, and so on, will occupy the corresponding slot in the uh, SM. And, uh, and this is more or less, if, if this is the whole frontier, we divide the frontier into chunks, and each of the chunks is assigned to one uh, thread block, as you can see. And in this particular example, we are using M thread blocks. What is what we do when we use uh, persistent thread blocks? When we use persistent thread blocks, we don't launch M thread blocks as here. We are going to launch only the thread blocks that can run concurrently on the available cores. I said before, we have two SMs, two GPU cores, and in each GPU core, we can execute two thread blocks for this specific kernel, depending on what are the, uh, the, 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 the uh, resource uh, usage of, uh, of the thread block, number of registers that are used, number um, amount of shared memory and so on. Imagine that it's only two thread blocks uh, per SM in this case. So we only launch four thread blocks in this particular example. And now what we are going to do for uh, with it, it, these thread blocks is that they are <clears throat> going to, uh, let's say, update their uh, thread ID virtually in order to compute uh, on other parts of the frontier. So if this is our frontier, uh, thread block zero, one, two, start working on the, uh, with the nodes that are in this part of the frontier, after block zero finishes with this part of the frontier, will move to this other part of the frontier that was assigned to block four in the original implementation. Observe that now, the good thing of doing this is that first, the GPU is occupied, same as before, no change because uh, where we had block four replacing block zero when block zero terminates, now we have block zero itself going to another part of the input data, the input frontier, and working on it. So as you see, the utilization of the cores is exactly the same. We are always using all the available slots uh, for thread blocks in, in each of the uh, individual uh, GPU cores. But now we have an additional advantage. Now, the advantage is that whenever we want to synchronize these thread blocks, we can do it using global memory. Why is that? Because we are 100% sure that these four guys are running together and are going to be running together all the time for the whole execution of the kernel. While in the original approach, we didn't know anything about the scheduling order of, uh, say, block zero, block one, block two, block three, four, five, six, and so on. So we couldn't. Uh, really know when these guys were executed in order to synchronize them using global memory. So for persistent thread blocks, we can explore some sort of atomic-based block synchronization uh, in global memory. And this is more or less the structure or the skeleton of our BFS algorithm. The BFS algorithm uh, continues the execution iteration after iteration until we have visited all nodes uh, in the graph, which means that we don't have any new nodes in the output frontier. So when the frontier size is zero, means that we have already visited all the nodes that we could visit. And, uh, and as you know already, once we have an input frontier, we distribute the nodes uh, in this input frontier across the available threads. So um, these threads uh, will iterate uh, over the nodes in the frontier, will visit the neighbors, of uh, the nodes in the frontier, in the input frontier, and will enqueue in the output frontier or in the output uh, queue um, if needed, if uh, one of the neighbors is worth visiting in the next iteration. After all the nodes in the frontier are visited, then uh, we can update the frontier size, the size of the next frontier or the size of the output queue, and where in the original implementation, kernel two, we could simply terminate the kernel. Here, we're going to use some 
atomic uh, operation based uh, global synchronization. And here you have the code for this uh, global synchronization. It's a kind of simplified, uh, uh, but, but, but uh, in the end, uh, it should work uh, uh, something, uh, I mean, in a, in a similar way as, uh, as you have it here. Uh, observe that for every thread in a thread block, we have a local thread ID, is this thread ID x dot x. And we also have a global thread ID that this corresponds to the index of the thread in the whole grid. That's why to calculate it, we use the thread index, local thread index, and also the block index. And then we also have two uh, variables that we initialize like zero from the beginning. Uh, it's this uh, uh, pointer threads run and pointer threads end. We are going to see how to use them. Uh, when we uh, start the execution uh, of, the, of the algorithm, remember we have an input frontier, we visit all the neighbors of the frontier and at some point we will arrive to this point here. So that means that we uh, update this uh, frontier value, which is just counting uh, not the size of the uh, not the size of the frontier, but the uh, the iteration, the the, the iteration number. Uh, it starts in zero, and after uh, executing the um, BFS iteration, uh, we update it, uh, add one, and here observe that for every thread block, we have a leader thread in this thread block that is uh, the thread with index equals zero that updates this pointer threads n, adds one on it using an atomic operation. This is a counter, a global counter that is accessible to all uh, thread blocks. And here what we are essentially doing is uh, when the thread block, the threads in the th thread block reach this point means that they are done, are co uh, have completed the previous iteration. So they update this variable to indicate that they are done. In the end, we know how many thread, blo thread blocks we launch, uh, right? And, 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 and the number of thread blocks is grid dim. Um, so we have another thread and this in this case is only one thread in the whole GPU. And, and we have chosen this uh, thread with global thread ID equals zero that is continuously checking in a VC weighting the value of these pointer threads end until this value is equal to grid beam. That is, is equal to the number of thread blocks that we launch. Remember our previous example, in our previous example, we launch four thread blocks. So when these uh, pointer threads end is equal four, the execution will continue. And when that happens, what the global, I mean, the, 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 let's say the leader uh, thread of the whole GPU, GPU which is this uh, thread with thread ID, global thread ID equals zero, it resets the pointer threads run and counts one new iteration. So observe that now we have the remaining threads. Uh, so all those threads that are leaders, thread zero of individual thread blocks, waiting here in this while. And they are continuously checking this pointer threads run that is going to be updated by the uh, thread with global ID equals zero. So uh, what we do at this point is comparing the value of pointer threads run with the uh, uh, value of the iteration, the frontier number, right? And uh, if we have increased this pointer threads run, means that all thread blocks have gone through uh, this part here are completely done with the execution of the uh, corresponding iteration of the algorithm. So now uh, we can we have increased the uh, iteration number and, 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 and we compare it to this uh, other iteration number here uh, when they are the same um, execution finishes and uh, we will start the next iteration of the algorithm. Observe that in this global synchronization, we are not using all threads in the GPU. We are only using leader threads per block or a leader thread, leader thread for the whole uh, GPU. Where are the rest of threads waiting? They would be waiting here in this sync thread. One thread, let's say thread one or thread, or thread 34 uh, of uh, thread block zero will be waiting here for its uh, uh, thread, uh, neighbor thread uh, in the same thread block with 
uh, thread ID uh, equals zero, right? So while uh, the leader threads are here in this uh, synchronization, in this uh, ping pong uh, that uh, we have here with the pointer threads end and pointer threads uh, run, the rest of threads are waiting in the sync threads. And after that, they will start the new uh, iteration with the new frontier. So this uh, atomic-based block synchronization was proposed um, like, um, several years ago. Uh, it's uh, pretty useful in, in cases where um, it makes sense to use uh, persistent blocks uh, to apply some optimization to get rid of this um, uh, overhead of the term kernel termination and relaunch. And, and we have used it in, uh, in different applications. One of the applications where we have used it is uh, segmentation of uh, in medical image analysis. Uh, segmentation is uh, essentially a technique uh, to obtain the area of a, a certain region of an image. And in a medical uh, image, it, that may be an organ or might be a tumor or uh, something like that. There are different algorithms to do uh, segment segmentation. And, uh, and as you see, uh, the output of the segmentation is like uh, uh, some uh, region that is highlighted in this case is a vessel, in this case is a liver, or in this other case, a tumor. And as I said, there are different algorithms. Uh, a very popular one is called region growing or seeded uh, region growing uh, that uh, essentially uh, consists of placing one seed on one point of the image that we know that belongs to the area uh, of interest, for example, the liver, uh, we could place the uh, seed, for example, here. And then uh, from that seed, we have a region that um, starts growing. Um, uh, so uh, yeah, so that's uh, what we would do. We start with it. We set a seed in a pixel of the image that we know that belongs to the region of interest. And then we check iteratively if the region can grow. If it can grow, if it can grow, uh, grow, we find neighbors, essentially pixels that have the same characteristics as the seed or the, uh, the uh, new seeds that we will, uh, new points that we will keep incorporating into the region. There are different ways of, uh, of uh, applying, I mean, finding the neighbors and applying these similarity criteria, for example, checking um, what are the gradients. Uh, if there is not uh, much, uh, like a high gradient, not much change in the pixel values, then probably uh, the, 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 the pixel, the neighboring pixels belong to the same surface. If there is a large change in the, um, the, the gradient is high, so it means that there is a large change in the pixel values. So probably uh, it belongs already to another area of the image. But uh, yeah, in the end, the region growing algorithm, as I said, um, in, uh, grows the region in the directions that is possible. And if you uh, think about it, what we are doing here is essentially dynamic data extraction, right? Iteration after iteration, we visit new pixels, we check uh, whether these pixels belong to the region of interest or not. If they belong to the region of, of interest means that the region has grown. And um, if it's grown, then it makes sense to try again. And at some point the region stops growing, and, uh, and then we terminate the kernel. So how do we implement this with the, let's say, naive, straightforward way? We will launch a new kernel every time that we want to revisit the region and see if the uh, region can grow, right? Uh, so uh, we would set a seed. If the region can grow, uh, we launch a kernel. The kernel needs to terminate. Now we have more points in the region. We assign new threads to these new points in the region and launch a new kernel again and again. And it, this is uh, uh, pretty costly as uh, you already know. So solution that we can apply here using atomic-based interblock synchronization uh, that uh, and, and persistent thread blocks, uh, which is a technique that allow us to continue the execution iteration after iteration without uh, terminating the kernel. As I said, uh, we have tried uh, this in several four works and, uh, and, and actually very successfully, very uh, interesting performance results. This was a uh, uh, work of uh, a former PhD student, uh, Nitin Satpute, um, and, and, and here I, 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 I give you some uh, titles of uh, his papers and, and links to the papers if you are interested in these kind of applications and the, applic uh, the usage of this uh, interblock synchronization. But now we are going to go one step farther. We have already seen how to use queues in a hierarchical manner. We have seen how to use um, uh, 
different types of kernels, like uh, simpler ones with a single thread block, uh, with more thread blocks using kernel termination and relaunch, using persistent threads, and so on. Um, now we are going to very briefly, and we will be done, uh, discuss uh, collaborative implementation. A collaborative implementation, meaning a fine-grained heterogeneous implementations that implementation that can use different types of devices. In our case, uh, in this example, we consider CPU or GPU, and uh, in the experiment, uh, I mean, and, and, and we start with some motivation results uh, that we obtain using an NVIDIA uh, JetSong uh, board that is um, uh, a small board that contains an, uh, an, uh, an ARM CPU and also uh, some uh, GPU cores this uh, particular version that we use here um, has uh, two SMs, two GPU cores, and uh, note, observe these results. So in this plot, what we are uh, measuring is the average execution time per iteration and the average, uh, and the average nodes per frontier. Notice that in the uh, X axis, we have the total number of frontiers, it's almost uh, 1,200 frontiers that are uh, clustered in, um, uh, in the, you know, like uh, um, 100 by 100. So the first 100 frontiers are here, the next 100 frontiers are here, and so on. You can see how, and uh, as we were expecting as well, because in BFS we start uh, with a single node and then we start exploring the graph, it's normal that the uh, frontier size increases, this black line increases at, until some point. At this point, we will probably have visited most or a, a majority of the nodes uh, of, the bird, of the graph. So uh, at that point, the size of the frontiers starts uh, decreasing as you see. In this uh, particular experiment, we use uh, uh, the, the roads, a graph with the roads of uh, New York City. And uh, another thing that you can observe here as well is that these bars, the red one corresponds to the CPU, while the uh, uh, green one corresponds to the GPU. This, um, um, this, uh, so the first observation here is that these bars are higher when we have uh, more nodes in the frontier. I think that's obvious. Uh, however, what is really uh, interesting here is that when the frontiers are pretty small, observe that the CPU is significantly high and faster than the GPU. So the execution time for the frontier on the CPU is, uh, is uh, lower than the execution time for the frontier on the GPU. And this happens at the very end, and it happens at the, ver at the very beginning and at the very end of the execution. So one uh, way of uh, implementing a heterogeneous uh, version of this uh, BFS algorithm or collaborative implementation of this BFS algorithm is to have the host checking what's this frontier size. This code here uh, runs on the host, on the CPU. We check what's the frontier size. If the frontier size is pretty low, lower than certain value, we only launch CPU threads. If the frontier size is um, larger, uh, than this uh, limit of this threshold that we have here, we launch a GPU kernel. Then internally, the GPU kernel can use uh, kernel termination and relaunch or can use um, interblock synchronization. We, can, we could even have uh, like a, like a, another possibility here, like a, a, another if else, uh, else, else if here that could be using at the same time CPU and uh, GPU threads if for example, the, the, the size of the frontier is huge, right? We could partition it statically and assign uh, some of the nodes in the frontier to the CPU and, and, and the rest to the GPU, and this way um, uh, obtain a little bit uh, more performance. Um, the, the idea here is that after launching CPU threads or launching GPU kernel, as I said, because you can use, uh, I mean, the, the, the um, uh, CPU threads uh, can synchronize without a problem, uh, but the GPU uh, thread blocks, we need to use persistent thread blocks if we want the kernel to keep running uh, while the condition of the size of the frontier is satisfied. Uh, whenever it's not satisfied anymore because we are reaching the end of the, of the graph and the frontiers now start um, shrinking again, we could terminate the kernel and return the control to the uh, CPU. And this collaborative implementation might not work amazingly well in all cases, but in the worst case, it will be as, uh, as good as the GPU only version, as you see for this Bay uh, graph, 
And in some other graphs like the uh, New York graph, uh, we, we could achieve uh, a performance improvement of uh, 15%, which is uh, not uh, that bad for um, this kind of optimization. And this is all for today. If you want to uh, read more about uh, graph processing, graph search uh, on GPUs, please take a look at chapter 12 of uh, massively par uh, programming massively parallel processors. Uh, now, let me know if uh, there are any questions. If there are not, I think that uh, we uh, would be done for today. I don't see uh, any questions in YouTube, um, but. Uh, yeah, uh, feel free to reach later if uh, uh, something comes and, uh, and you want to ask. Um, uh, same here uh, for people in Zoom. If you don't have uh, any questions right now, you can contact me later. Thank you very much for your attention and uh, see you uh, in our next.